Gentlemen, this is the Mustang. It can fly close. Uh, I mean, uh, that was the Mustang. Pretty fast, huh? However, there are some nasty rumors floating around about this ship. And we might just as well admit they're true. Some pilots don't like the P-51. Here are the pilots. However, our pilots don't seem to agree with these gentlemen. Here's what they have to say. I peeled off away from that 109 like I was standing still. And when it comes to blasting enemy pillboxes... Yes, sir. She's the baby for low-level attack. Why, well, I was on top of that supply column before the Nazis knew I was coming. <laughs> Gentlemen, that was the Mustang. Designed, built, and flown in 180 days. Ordered in 1940 because the British foresaw the day when the deliveries made by the JU-88s to Coventry would be returned with interest. An escort fighter which could fly farther and faster in protecting our bombers, delivering those bundles from Britain. Gentlemen, that was the Mustang. But today, in order to accompany our new bombers deep into enemy territory, our fighters must fly farther still and higher. Out of this need arose... Well, Colonel, there she is, the P-51B. Looks like the old Mustang, doesn't she? Yes, much of the construction is exactly the same. But Mr. Deech, using the same basic design as the P-51A, has built a ship that'll fight from 25,000 feet on up. That's the new engine, eh? That's the Rolls-Royce Merlin 61, built by Packard. It's a 12-cylinder job like the Allison and the P-51A, but it packs a military rating of 1,520 horsepower and a war emergency rating of 1,630 horsepower and a two-stage supercharger. This two-stage blower and external fuel tanks mean it can serve as a high-altitude escort fighter for long-range bombers, besides doubling as a low-altitude fighter, dive, or low-level bomber. And with 150-gallon fairing tanks under each wing, your pilots will be hopping the Atlantic pretty soon without too much trouble. And we're putting an 85-gallon tank in the fuselage, back of the pilot seat. Now, these tanks, or the bombs, these are dummies, of course. Go on these racks on each side, as you know. Without these racks, the plane has 15 miles per hour more at top speed. But this ship is faster than the old model, even with the racks on. And we're swinging a four-bladed prop to absorb the extra power. It's a Hamilton hydromatic constant speed job with cuffs. Now, we're using the same laminar flow airfoil as before. It made the Mustang such a fast ship. And, uh... This is a newly designed aileron that gives the ship an extremely fast rate of roll. We call it the sealed balance type. I have a diagram here that illustrates how this aileron works. Now, the normal aileron looks like this. When the aileron moves up into the airflow, air leaks through the space between the aileron and the wing. That's where a lot of the force applied to the stick is wasted. But our sealed balance aileron lessens to a great extent the force required. Because the part of the airflow that formerly escaped can no longer do so. The cloth connection stops it. Therefore, this airflow, which formerly escaped, exerts a force down on the airtight cloth, which in turn enables the pilot to force the wing down with much less effort. You don't have to tell me why that's important in lining up those 450s there in a Messerschmitt or a Focker Wolf. We have a pretty insulation on those guns. Let's take a look at it. Sam. Give me a hand with these access doors here. I uh, want you to notice I we laid the guns on the side to eliminate any bulge in the air force. We're using a simplified mounting that allows removal in a few seconds. What about the guns the Jerry's and the Japs are packing? What kind of protection does a pilot have from enemy gunfire? Well, let's take a look at the sketches, shall we? We'll show you. Here we are. The P-51B is equipped with face-hardened steel armor plating 
and an armor glass windshield. This affords protection for the pilot from bullets hitting within this area. We've also protected the coolant tank and the nose from frontal attack. In other words, in flight you get these cones of protection from enemy bullets. Which should be comforting news to the pilot. Well, personally I think it's a good idea to get rid of the enemy before he has a chance to try the armor plating. You've got something there, Major. Arthur, let's stop shooting the breeze and get this ship off the ground. <laughs> okay, Bob. Colonel, if you'll join me in the control tower, we'll have grandstand seats. Right. See you later, children. Right, sir. Bob will give a continuous radio report on everything he does in this plane which might deviate from normal pilot procedure, even if it's scratching his ear in the middle of a loop. Hello, Mr. Keith. Hello, Charlie. These are the gentlemen I called you about. Colonel, let's get over to where we can see things. Ah, there's Bob. Now, you notice he gets in the plane from the rear, and the uh, flaps are kept down to prevent anyone stepping on them. Now, Bob, before he gets into the cockpit, checks the Zeus buttons on the radio compartment panels. Once inside the cockpit, he gets comfortable, adjusts the rudder pedals, gets his shoulder harness set. Well, they should be ready by now. Charlie, let's give them a call. Okay, Mr. Deeds. Hello, Army 115. This is Mines Tower. The air is all yours, Bob. Nothing expected for the next hour. Over. Hello, Mines Tower. This is Army 115. Well, here's where I start the monologue. Hope your ears can take it. I've checked the servicing of the ship to have an idea of the amount of load I'm carrying. The rate of climb can vary as much as 500 feet a minute, depending on the load. I close the cockpit enclosure by first pulling the left side into position, then lowering the upper portion. And I make sure the enclosure handle is locked in place with a safety latch, and rear hatch and felt molding is checked. He checks to see that the warning pins in the right sliding track are down. Pins checked. Starting the regular before starting engine check. Oh, by the way, if you were going to make an engine run up on the ground, especially pulling more than 40 inches of manifold pressure, be sure that the tail of the P-51B is anchored securely, that the flaps are kept up. You see, the weight of the new Rolls-Royce engine has moved the center of gravity forward. And as a result, the slipstream from the prop was liable to force the tail up. During my regular check, I make sure that the emergency boost control is in automatic as I'm only to use it in case of war emergency for not more than five minutes at a time. Making sure supercharger control in automatic and not in low. Coolant and oil switches checked in automatic. Fuel booster pump on normal. Finish check, starting engine. Clear. The fuel booster pump draws from whatever tank the selector is on. We try to cut down on the number of things a pilot has to do. That's why the ship has an automatic manifold pressure regulator connected to the throttle. But the pilot will have to be careful under icing conditions, because the automatic regulator will try to compensate until the carburetor is completely iced up. May I have the microphone, please, Colonel? Are you ready, Bob? She's warmed up, ready for taxiing. Here I go. The attitude of this ship makes ground visibility very poor. So hissing is necessary even more than in most airplanes with a conventional type landing gear. In order to save the brakes, use the steerable tailwheel feature. If I hold the stick at neutral, or slightly aft of neutral, the tailwheel is steerable six degrees on each side. All I have to do is move the rudder pedal. The six degree steering feature doesn't allow sharp turns. In order to make one, I simply push the stick forward. The tail wheel unlocks and becomes full swiveling. However, excessive throttle or excessive use of brakes with the stick forward should be avoided to prevent nosing over. Making regular cockpit check. If in doubt, use the checklist. Every army plane's got one. Flaps up. Pool is open. Trim tabs, seven degrees, right rudder trim. 
Note that I switch the fuel booster pump to emergency. The pump draws from whichever tank the selector is on. Instruments, OK. Switches on main panel, OK. Checking oxygen gauge. Switches right panel, OK. Gas tanks, full. Running, Running up, up engine, engine checking, checking mags. Now, I use no flaps normally for takeoff. But if I were carrying bombs or external tanks, I might use them. So to show the operation, I'll use them this time. The best settings, 20 degrees flaps and six degrees tail heavy on the elevators, as the plane will get off more quickly and give a greater feeling of control that way. The manifold pressure can be used as you need it up to 61 inches. The propeller control is fully forward for the maximum RPM of 3,000. Taking off. Keeping the tail on the ground and use of rudder trim, as I said before, counteracts normal torque action on takeoff. A bit of back pressure on the stick has to be used to keep the tail down. Landing gear up. Here come the flaps. Practically no settling when they're raised. Fuel booster pump in normal. The plane feels normal now that it's off the ground. I'm heading upstairs. Let's get a pair of binoculars so we can see what's going on. Colonel, there's a pair, Major. Thank you. Twenty thousand feet. The supercharger just changed over in a high blower. A jump seems to occur in the engine, then the manifold pressure returns to its original setting. It switches at an altitude of between 20,000 and 20,500 feet. Heading on upstairs. Twenty-five thousand feet. I've leveled off. Hello, children. Hello. How is she on directional trim changes when speed and horsepower are varied? I'll throttle back and give it a whirl. The airplane is stable at all normal loadings, but the directional trim changes at low speeds as horsepower and speed is varied. However, the rudder tap corrects this effectively with only a slight adjustment, and it should be used as necessary. Normally, there is no trouble as the plane is naturally stable. That means the P-51B will remain at any altitude without adjusting the trim tabs. Less work for the pilot. Now, I'm going to show her stalling characteristics. The stall is comparatively mild and occurs at approximately 95 miles per hour indicated with gear and flaps up. About three or four miles above this stalling speed, a slight elevator buffet occurs. Plane six at distance. Then rolls over on one wing. It doesn't whip over as some other planes do and has very little tendency to drop into a spin. The recovery is completely normal. All that has to be done is to release the back pressure on the stick and apply opposite rudder. With the gear and flaps down, the stall would have the same characteristics as before. Only it occurs at about 85 miles per hour indicated. Uh, naturally, with combat tanks or bombs making an extra load, the stalling speeds are higher. I'm going to an accelerated stall. A heavy buffet occurs around the wing root fillet and the horizontal stabilizer three or four miles per hour above actual stalling speed. But the plane recovers immediately by releasing pressure on the stick. The accelerated stall has stronger warning characteristics than a normal stall. Hello, Bob. Show us a couple of dives. Okay, Colonel. Here she goes. Plane gains speed extremely fast in a dive. Tends to veer slightly to the right and continue in a dive without pulling itself out for quite a long time.
The propeller doesn't overrun during the dive, does it? Not a bit. I put it at 3,000 RPM and it stayed nailed there. Any other questions, sir? No, thanks. How about doing a couple of rolls for us? Here's one to the left. Rate of roll is extremely fast, especially at high speeds. That's due to the sealed balance aileron. The final result of 14 different designs. That fast roll really counts, too. Yes, that means the pilot can disengage the enemy a lot quicker. We believe the only enemy ship that can approach it for speed of roll is a Fokker Wolf 190. Here's, Here's another dive. dive. In the dive, the pilot doesn't have to maintain excessive forward pressure on the stick. Catch the slight tendency to veer to the right with a trim tab, if in a prolonged dive. Otherwise, the ship is positively stable in the dive. Hello, Arthur. I'm going up to high altitude and put her in a maximum speed dive to show you how fast you'll go before reaching compressibility. Okay, Bob, let us know when you're up there. Roger. Roger. Well, then, while Bob's climbing, there are some points that might interest you, gentlemen. Let's sit down, shall we? Colonel? Thank you. Uh, as you know, the true speed of a plane at the time compressibility occurs, divided by the speed of sound at that altitude, gives us a figure called the Mach number. So named after the man who discovered the relationship. Let's take an example. We'll say the plane reached compressibility at 560 miles per hour. That's true airspeed at 10,000 feet altitude. Dividing this speed by 724, the speed of sound at 10,000 feet, we get, and gentlemen, we've done this arithmetic many times before, 0.76, the Mach number. Now that number indicates the speed a plane can dive at any given altitude. The higher the Mach number, the faster the plane can dive without encountering compressibility trouble. We believe the P-51B has the highest Mach number of any fighter. Now, there's a point I'd like to make to pilots about getting into compressibility, but first, a little more dope. The Mach number of any given ship remains the same no matter what the altitude, but the speed of sound decreases at high altitudes. So, the higher the altitude, the less speed required to get into compressibility. Let's get back to our problem. Suppose we were at 30,000 feet. Then x, the speed we could go, divided by the decreased speed of sound at that altitude, 680 miles per hour, equals the Mach number, 0.76. Solving, we find that we could go only 517 miles per hour before getting compressibility. One more thing. The higher the altitude, the faster the true speed for any given indicated speed and as I said, the lower true speed required to reach compressibility. So, here's the point, and it's an important one. The pilot should remember that at high altitudes, he reaches compressibility at much lower indicated speeds than at low altitudes. At any rate, observe the speed limitations posted in the cockpit. 38,000. Are you all set down there? I guess we're all set. We had enough theory for the moment, anyhow. Major, should we let him know we're still down here? Right. Hello, Bob. We're all set down here. You really gonna wind her up for us? Just you, all under your hat, Major. Okay. Give us your indicated speed and how she acts when you get her into compressibility, will you? Roger. I'll, I'll be, be down, down in a minute. minute. Three hundred, three fifty, four hundred, four forty. Compressibility. Stick moving fore and aft. Slight elevator overbalance. Heavy bumping on tail section. Oscillation occurs rapidly. However, control forces on elevators remain unchanged. Plane hunts slightly along horizontal axis. Pulling out now. No difficulty except buffeting continues until a lower speed has been reached. 440 indicated at that height. That's really moving.
Enemy fighters will have a hell of a time trying to keep up with this ship in a dive. They really would, Colonel. I'm going to try a couple of spins. I'll do a right spin first. Here she goes. In a right spin, there is a continuous oscillation. A slight rudder buffet is present. Procedure for recovery completely normal. No trouble getting out of the spin. Probably try one to the left now. For three turns, an oscillation is present as in the right spin. Then the spin becomes stable. Recovery is the same. Full opposite runner, then stick in neutral. Going into a sustained side slip. Couldn't hold it. I'll do another. The plane will not hold a sustained side slip. The aileron control is insufficient to hold it on a side slipping angle. The ship automatically tends to straighten out. However, it will side slip long enough to avoid enemy fire. What about prohibitive maneuvers? The usual limitations? Right. No snap rolls, inverted spins, or outside loops. Hello, Bob. How about some aerobatics? Roger. Here's a loop. And into an Immelman. Here's a climbing roll. At high cruise, this airplane will even do a loop or emblement from level flight position. Of course, with the external fuel tanks or bombs installed, acrobatic maneuvers are prohibited. Also, every pilot should be warned not to fly inverted for more than 10 seconds. In that position, the scavenger pump fails to operate and oil pressure drops. Going up to the field, field Colonel. Why don't you to launch this for speed? Here he comes. Watch this. Like a bat out of hell. Boy, that was beautiful. Anything, Anything else I can, can show you while I'm up, up here? here? That was beautiful, Bob. Thanks, Colonel. I'll show you her gliding characteristics. I'll make a glide approach before landing. Right. Let's move over to where we'll watch them come around. You show your power off glide first. The ship is designed so it can glide any safe speed down to a margin of about 25% above stalling speed. With the gear and flaps up, the glide is fairly flat. The nose being high makes forward visibility poor. Now, uh, if you lower either the landing gear or the flaps or both, you greatly steepen the gliding angle and increase the rate of descent. Hello, my star. This is Army 115. Request landing instructions. Over. Hello, Army 115. This is Mines Tower. You clear to land, Bob. Use runway 25. Over. Roger. Out. Making normal pre-landing cockpit check. Checking that fuel selector in on fullest tanks. Propeller control at 2,500 RPM. This setting gives a margin to apply power in case of a bad landing and helps prevent the engine from over-revving. There's a tendency to do that due to the flat position of the blades 
and lag of the Fritz control mechanism. Mixture control in auto rich. Oil and coolant radiator scoops in automatic. Lower the landing gear only below 170 indicated. By pushing landing gear handle in down position, make sure it's securely snapped so vibration won't jiggle it up. Adjust power and trim to maintain 150 indicated. When the airplane has been brought into the wing for landing, the flap should be lowered fully. But be sure the indicated is below 165. As soon as I turn into the field, I maintain gliding speed of around 115 with an all whirl. With a full load, including auxiliary ferrying tanks, the gliding speed is between 125 and 130. Adjust the trim tab to assist in landing. It's a beautiful landing. You might just as well cross wind. The wide landing gear and the lockable tail wheel make it safe. But as you know, never use more than half flaps. Well, let's go down to the line and talk to Bob. Thank you. Well, how'd you like it, Colonel? Nice show, Bob. Mr. Deep, I think we've got something. Thank you, sir. Nice landing, Bob. But well, tell me, what happens if you make a bad one, if you bounce her in? Do you give her the gun and bring her around again, or do you just ease it in? Well, if the attempted landing is badly made so that the wing drops or you get a bad bounce, go around again. But don't slam the throttle open, because if you're too near stalling speed, engine torque will drive you right into the ground. You should ease the power on, get the nose down, and go around again. If at the last moment you decide not to make a landing, ease the throttle open, and when you reach an airspeed of about 110 and an altitude of about 300 feet, raise the flaps by degree a notch at a time after raising landing gear. Uh, tell me, what about engine failure during flight? <laughs> engine failure during flight. Pull the emergency release handle of the cockpit enclosure so you won't be trapped inside in case it jams on landing. Lean forward when you do, because the hatch might clip you on the ear. Drop your external fuel tanks. And if this time, lower the flaps. But remember, you've got to do it by hand because your hydraulic pressure is gone. Keep your landing gear retracted and land on the belly of the ship. It's no tea party, but you shouldn't have too much trouble. Oh, uh, one more thing. Get away from the ship as quickly as possible, because the cockpit can get a little warm in case a fire starts. Tell me, how does she behave on scramble takeoffs? Oh, same as any other fighter. If she isn't warm, the oil has to be diluted enough to ensure proper oil pressure at moderate power. Then, as soon as the engine will take the throttle, just taxi out and take off. But apply the throttle slowly and steadily. Sudden application, as in any takeoff, causes the engine to cough and spin. How'd you like me to check you out on it, Major? What are we waiting for? Excuse me, Colonel. Gentlemen, that's the Army's improved version of the Mustang. A stronger, longer range Mustang for high altitude fighting. And today, thousands more are being made by workers on the production line for you on the fighting line.
I'm Colonel Bud Anderson, and I'm going to do a, you might say, a walk around on a P 51B Bravo airplane. Uh, this particular airplane right here is painted exactly like my airplane was painted in World War II. It's been restored by Jack Roush, and he's done a marvelous job of uh, restoring it. And one of the main features, of course, is the uh, Malcolm Hood, which is quite a quite a modification on the, uh, on the P-51Bs and, and, uh, and Cs. Bs and Cs had uh, what we call a birdcage canopy, and you opened it like this, over the top like that, and of course it had slats on the thing, and of course when you're looking out, uh, the damn slat is right there by your eye. And so these were marvelous improvement. Uh, for a pilot to uh, look around in aerial combat. Well, when you did a walk around in the morning, he usually uh, came out from operations and walked out to your airplane. Your crew chief would meet you uh, somewhere in the area. And then you'd go over the paperwork and sign the Form 1A, the um, uh, maintenance records on the airplane that, uh, uh, that, that, the, that the military kept at the time. Uh, and discuss anything about the airplane if you wanted. Of course, this was my own personal airplane, and I knew it very well. And uh, and I had a, a wonderful uh, crew, a ground crew. Uh, I flew all of my combat missions, 116, with uh, 480 hours and 20 minutes of combat flying without a single abort for any reason whatsoever. That's pretty remarkable, actually. Have it, having said uh, what my uh, combat record was, uh, 116 missions without an abort, uh, leads me to my, uh, my crew chief story, which I like to tell uh, whenever I can. Uh, you know, I think you could imagine yourself being a, a crew chief of, a, of an airplane, World War II. Your pilot's doing the fighting and the dying, and uh, you're back here maintaining that airplane. And, and, uh, and uh, you know, uh, if you're the crew chief, that's your airplane. And you're, you're a part of it. And when that guy gets a kill and puts it up in here, that's your kill too. The guys were very, uh, uh, very supportive and wanted to do their part. Uh, uh, just uh, incredible. And the story I like to tell, uh, my crew chief story, is about uh, my second tour when I, uh, I had a, uh, a P-51D uh, dog, the classic model over here. And it was camouflaged in this uh, dark green camo, completely, just about like this airplane here. And uh, it was my second tour, and Otto, Otto Heino had been uh, promoted to tech sergeant, and uh, crew chiefs were staff sergeant. So uh, he had a flight of uh, six airplanes to oversee. And so he handpicked a new crew chief for me, Mel Schooneman. And then, of course, the third member of my, my crew was uh, Leon Zimmerman, who was my armor. Uh, all three of those guys were, those were my crews uh, during World War II and also during my P-39 training. So uh, as the story goes in uh, my second tour, uh, I have the, the completely camouflaged uh, D, and uh, I think it was in November of uh, 1944. I remember it was uh, snowing over Germany, and it said snow had hit the night before, and I mean a big time snow, and all of northern Germany and northern Europe was, uh, was uh, in dense snow. 
and I looked down. We used to fly in the finger, fingertip four, uh, a leader and a wingman and a, a uh, element leader and a wingman. And I looked down against the, um, here's, a, here's a nice white surface right here with the f f flying of four. And at this point of time, uh, we weren't paying too much attention to the uh, paint schemes. And we had all green ones, we had all silver ones, we had uh, some that were in half, half camo and half silver. And I'm looking down at this snow, and which one stood out? Well, of course, the dark ones stood out, the camouflaged airplanes stood out. So I, I made a mental note to talk to my crew when I got back to um, after the mission. When I landed, I uh, got them together and I said, you know, uh, it's snowing over there and I'm going to finish my tour in the winter. Uh, whenever this thing is laid up for heavy maintenance, would you please depaint it, take the, the, um, the camo off of it and make it a silver paint scheme? And I put it to them on a, uh, on a base, tactical basis that it might save my butt. Uh, but frankly, uh, you know, I had another reason. Uh, that was one reason, but I kind of thought the, uh, the all silver airplanes looked a little cooler than the all combo airplanes. So I told them that and I thought it would take, uh, you know, two or three days to do that. And I did tell them when it's laid up for heavy maintenance, please repaint the airplane. So uh, I went in and uh, I was the operations officer and I decided that I wanted to fly the next day, put my name on the board and went home and forgot about it. Next morning after uh, breakfast and getting the briefing come out, I grabbed my chute in operations and I walked out to my revetment. I'm the closest, my, my revetment was uh, easy walking distance from operation. I had my parachute over my shoulder and I climb up over the revetment and I'm standing there looking down and here's my, my Mustang sitting there in gleaming aluminum. And I was really quite flabbergasted, you know. I thought, wow, did those guys think I gave them a direct order to do that? And then I looked at them closely and I noticed their hands were, uh, were raw. You know, the skin had been pushed off of them and, uh, and they'd been rubbing and rubbing and a little bit of blood on them. And it made me feel uh, really, uh, <laughs> made it feel like hell. I said, I wonder, did these guys think I gave them a direct order to, to paint that thing right there? And then I thought about it a little bit and I said, no, you know, they wanted to do that. That was their contribution to the war. And uh, they, they wanted to just please me uh, however they could. And I just can't say enough about the crew chiefs of the world. So uh, after you uh, finish your paperwork and discussion with the crew chief, uh, they always had the airplanes just absolutely perfect and ready to go. And uh, uh, there wasn't much sense of uh, doing a walk around, but that's required. So we did a cursory walk around uh, to comply with the rules. A pilot will do a walk around. So, you walk around the airplane and just kind of checking. Here you want to make sure the gas caps are closed, the gun bay doors are down tight and smooth. Come over here, check the ailerons, see the tabs hooked together. Come along here, look on the wingtip, see if you don't, make sure you don't have any busted lights. Uh, this one doesn't have them all, and it has an extra light. We didn't have that one. And then you got over here, check your leading edge just so it's small, smooth, landing light, make sure it's not cracked and on. Then we got here, uh, we would have a big um, uh, 108 gallon of, uh, fuel tank. It was just round, cylinder round and round on the end. And they were made out of uh, pressed paper and resin. And uh, 
We did that so that we wouldn't drop aluminum tanks over Germany and give them uh, aluminum to help manufacture airplanes. They were very successful. Uh, but you had to get rid of them as soon as they were empty or if you got into combat, of course, you jettisoned them immediately because they were a lot of extra drag and they would not stand a lot of airspeed. I can't remember what it was, but after a certain airspeed, they would shred. So, and uh, we did carry bombs uh, uh, briefly for about 30 days uh, after the uh, Normandy beachhead landing. Okay, check your bomb. Uh, you check the guns, and this is a, there's a difference on the B and the D, of course. Uh, the B model only had two guns, but they were also mounted differently. Uh, and there's, there's several production changes this in, in the, between the B and the D, but one of them, they, these guns are, are laying in here sideways, and I don't know which way they lay. Yeah, probably this way. And so the, the ammo doesn't feed in there directly like that. It feeds at an angle. And so we were having gun jams um, when you were pulling G's and firing. The guns would jam and you had no way of uh, recharging them and all that. And we finally got that ironed out by having very clean uh, working guns and then putting uh, trays on top of the ammo so it wouldn't flop around. But when you're doing a walk around, you just check and make sure. They usually had tape over the things like that. You come around and check your tires. You know, the old saying, you fighter pilots come around and kick their tires. <laughs> but you just want to make sure that the tire was inflated. And you check uh, a lot of the things like that. Come under here and uh, check the uh, check any loose lines and stuff like that. These doors are uh, uh, hydraulically operated and we have the hydraulic pressure has been broken on them. So you can actually move them up and down. You wanna take a look at the radiator while you're under there and make sure there's no birds in there or stuff like that, rabbits and, <laughs> and other kind of animals. And then uh, come around and uh, check the props. There, these would all these would be removed, and there isn't much you can check. Uh, you're, you're looking for uh, Zeus's that are not tight, stuff like that. Check the propeller just for a, a smoothness, and you'd want to be sure that this thing was out. And uh, again, you check your. Uh, uh, check the main, uh, main, main street. And you come around on this side. And do the same. You get in here and you look around for loose, loose uh, lines. Um, anything that doesn't look there. Oh yeah, and on the landing gear you want to be sure that this thing isn't flat. It has a certain, you want to make sure there's a gap here on the, uh, on the Oloyo strut, so that it's not down here flat, or it's not stuck way up here, and the airplane would be cocked sideways like that. Uh, not much else you can check, just to make sure, you know, it's, everything's working. Again, the gun's the same thing. Uh, again, on this side, you, you would check your tank and just make sure it's hooked up properly and, and uh, look for any visual reference of a problem and on this side if uh, if you had a, a pedo pedo head to cover on it it would be removed your crew chief would remove it but if it wasn't you want to be sure and take that off because it will interfere with the uh, airspeed uh, indication properly smooth leading edge come on out here same thing check all this going back you get on the trim tab again, flaps, and again, you want to make sure all these doors and all these things are attached. And in particular, he wanted that to be sealed properly. And uh, come down in here. Now, when you come by the radiator, 
uh, the thing that I always look for when I first walk up on the airplane is to make sure that this uh, scoop is in what we call the open position. That's, that's manually wide open. And so you knew that the controls are set properly, but we always double checked them. Uh, this is a tie down hole that goes through there. Just make sure that the airplane isn't been tied, isn't tied down. Come around here, leading edge. Uh, the uh, B models that we had, the B's and the C's, uh, did not have this strake on it. Uh, they came right down here like that to the wing. And the, these, are, uh, these were a field mod. They came on some of the late production airplanes, but they were added uh, afterwards. Uh, Jack had a standard uh, tail and decided to add this uh, ventral to improve the directional uh, flying qualities of the airplane. You got the leading edge, counterbalance. All you're doing is just checking for, see that everything is here. Uh, trim tab, come around here. Here's the rudder tab and the rudder. And then you come around this side, same stuff. Check the wing, back and forth. And then uh, you're back here. You wanna just check your tail wheel, make sure it's inflated properly and the doors are unobstructed. And again, here's what we check here. Make sure that that thing is wide open. That's real important. Then the last thing on this side, you have the fuselage tank uh, thing. You wanna make sure it's closed and sealed properly. Okay, from uh, this point, you would uh, gather up your parachute. Uh, you might even be wearing it, be a back, sh back chute. And you uh, mount the airplane from this side, or you could come up the uh, strut on the front, and then uh, we'll go get in the cockpit, and I'll give you a kind of a run, a run around the cockpit, showing uh, where all the switches are and things like that. Fast and sleek, looking every inch the thoroughbred fighter it was, the North American P-51 Mustang rose from obscurity to carve out a unique place in aviation history. Loved by its pilots and feared by its enemies, the Mustang possessed a rare blend of speed, agility, and range. That made it an unbeatable air-to-air -air fighter. Pilot's airplane. A real comfortable pilot's airplane. Very honest, it, uh, no, no bad habits, no bad uh, tendencies, uh, great performance, lots of armament, lots of gas, lots of fuel. It, it, was, uh, it, it was a superior airplane in performance all around. I think it was the airplane of the war on, on any side. They were a beautiful airplane to fly, and I could sit there and reach all the switches and everything. I didn't have to get a bunch of pillows or anything. I could move the seats up and fly it, and it really was a uh, easy airplane to fly. 
I don't know how to describe it. They, as I said, they were very responsive. Uh, you felt you could outfly anything. It just was, it was an easy plane to, to take off, to land. It was very maneuverable. Uh, you could break right or left almost with equal ease. It had more power, more maneuverability, more speed, uh, more climb. It, uh, it probably uh, was better than anything the Germans had by 2%. Uh, I was in a lot of dogfights where I was very happy with my 2%. When the Mustang appeared in the skies over Europe, the United States Army Air Force pilots finally had the ability to carry the flight to the Luftwaffe over Nazi Germany itself. Oh, those planes were very maneuverable. The 109 and the 190 were good, good airplanes the Germans had. But then we got the, the 51s, which was a different story altogether. And when you got in this 51, and you think to yourself, oh, God, is this damn thing ever quits on? But that Merlin engine would run like an old Model A Ford. Just ran forever. Now, when the P-51 came along, that changed the the range, gosh, we can fly forever in a P-51. And uh, I think my longest P-51 mission was a little over six hours. P-38, oh, four and a half hours would be about the longest one, maybe 445. So there are some targets that uh, became available to us after we got the P-51. And while the German Fachwolf and Messerschmitt outclassed earlier American fighters, the P-51 outperformed them both. Plane for plane, nothing could beat a Mustang with a good man behind the stick. I got behind this guy on a descending course and was gaining on him. And I opened fire and I had a number of hits on his wings and fuselage. And he immediately broke hard up. And again, I was overrunning him, so I had to go up and then back down. But when I turned back down, I found him coming up at me. And I, I not to this day, figured out how he did that. But I know that he got on my tail. The uh, 109 has a 20 millimeter cannon that fires right through the hub of the propeller. And I went into a Luffberry circle. That's as tight a circle as you can turn. And he was directly behind me so that my only view of him was to look straight back like this in my, and every time I looked that 20 millimeter cannon was blinking and uh, I've got nothing but a thin plexiglass cover over my head. Fortunately, those shells were going just behind my tail. I made, uh, I think, probably 75 to 100 circles, but whether it was the Mustang that much better than the 109 or whether I was that much better than him or a combination of both, I was gaining on him. And he finally rolled over and headed straight down and I decided to let him get away. And he got away and so did I. I hit him, he didn't hit me, but we had a 10 minute individual battle. Though today, the Mustang is considered to be one of the greatest American fighters ever built. Oddly enough, it began its career as a reconnaissance aircraft flown not by the United States, but by Britain's Royal Air Force. It would take almost four years for the Mustang to evolve into a war winner. Four years that started with an odd request at an impossible deadline in the darkest days of World War II. The British were looking to the U.S. 
aircraft manufacturers to make air fighter aircraft for them. They approached North American hoping they would build P-40 Warhawks. North American came back at them with a counterproposal. They would design and build and fly a completely new aircraft within 100 days. At the time in 1940, the British were utterly desperate for anything that could be a combat-ready fighter, so they were going all over the United States looking for anything that they could purchase. When North American made their proposal, the Brits actually snapped at the opportunity. They just went for it because they needed aircraft quickly, and North American was promising delivery of the prototype within 100 days or so, and they were promising an aircraft better than the P-40, and they needed something better than the Tomahawk. And in fact, North American did exactly what they promised. In 117 days, they had the prototype of the P-51 Mustang, which was called the NA-73, constructed. And within 130 days, that prototype flew for the first time. The British initially ordered 600 of the P-51s, and they're very enthusiastic about this aircraft. Uh, however, despite that enthusiasm by their British allies, the American aviation authorities are really not interested in the P-51 at all until two years later. The Royal Air Force soon took delivery of about 600 of the North American fighters, which they dubbed the Mustang One. British pilots soon discovered they had a terrific low-level aircraft on their hands. With the top speed of almost 390 miles an hour on the deck, the Mustang One was probably the fastest American fighter of its day. Light on the controls, very agile, and capable of climbing at over 3,000 feet a minute, the Mustang looked like a real winner. However, the new plane did have its share of serious drawbacks. The original Mustangs came out with Allison engines. They were extremely good for low-level work. And that's what the British used them for. Uh, low-level fighter sweeps, tactical recon. They were unsuited for long-range escort work because the engine could not perform adequately at high altitude. While the Mustang One did not have exceptional high altitude performance, the British still loved the aircraft because down low, it was awesome. It was fast, it was quick, it could get away from anything. So they used it in a variety of roles, uh, mainly low altitude tack recon and armed reconnaissance against ground targets. Uh, but sooner or later, they were bound to come in contact with the Luftwaffe, and in August of 1942, the first Mustang kill of the war was scored. And it's kind of an interesting incident because the fellow, uh, Hollis Hills, was a Royal Canadian Air Force pilot who happened to be an American flying an American aircraft in British service. And he shot down a Focke Wolf 190. So it was one of those uh, uh, incidents of the war that truly reflected the international character of the Allied war effort. Flying at treetop level and facing scores of light and medium flak batteries on every mission, the brave Mustang pilots pressed on, snapping photos of key installations and shooting up anything on the ground that moved. While the British found the Mustang very useful in Western Europe at first, the United States Army Air Force had little interest in the new fighter. It took some time before the Americans could be won over by the glowing reports coming back from the RAF on the Mustang combat record. Almost reluctantly, the USAAF ordered a small number of Mustangs, dubbed the P-51A, and sent them to observation and tactical reconnaissance squadrons. Unfortunately, the Allison engine and its lack of a supercharger continued to limit the plane's high-level performance, a fact not lost upon the American pilots. The very first P-51s were the A, had an Allison engine, and they were used for dive bombing and various things, but they were, uh, they were not very impressive. I flew an A, uh, oh, a few hours in an A out of England, just practicing, uh, we didn't have enough airplanes. And uh, so I flew, we had a couple of A's on the field and I flew that practice some dive bombing, because it was basically a dive bomber. 
they didn't have the power, uh, and uh, they were just uh, not as responsive. It had an Allison engine in it, uh, and it, it really couldn't keep up with much of anything. As I said, it was primarily a dive bomber. In late 1942, North American, utilizing some of the best features of the P-51A, unveiled a new version of the Mustang designed as a single-seat dive bomber and called it the A-36 Apache. Only a couple hundred A-36s were produced, enough to equip a couple of, of fighter-bomber groups, and those fighter-bomber groups ended up serving in the Mediterranean or in Burma. The problem with the A-36 was it couldn't carry a heavy load, especially compared to the P-47, so it didn't last long in service. It was also vulnerable to ground fire, and uh, in steep dives, uh, you had a tendency, the pilots had a tendency to, to uh, torque the uh, tail section and, and actually do structural damage in steep dives. So it was not particularly effective as a, as a combat dive bomber. But what it did do was uh, deliver ordnance with pinpoint accuracy far above and beyond anything that the other fighter bombers the Army Air Force had at the time. Coming in at a medium altitude, the Apache squadron would line up on their targets, then wing over into steep dives, opening their butterfly flaps as they went to slow their descent. Using their reflector gunships to aim, the pilots would wait until the very last possible moment to drop their bombs. At about 1,000 feet, they would pull up and come off a target. Such hair-raising dives took nerves of steel and excellent marksmanship. But when done right, no other Army Air Force aircraft could get its bombs on target with better accuracy. And since it had derived from a fighter, the A-36 could find its way out of trouble. In fact, Apache pilots scored many air-to-air -air victories, and at least one even became an ace. While the A-36 enjoyed limited success, dive bombing never really gained acceptance in an Army Air Force dominated by strategic bombing advocates. After serving about a year, the dive bomber groups were all re-equipped and given fighters. In the A-36, the Mustang had reached an evolutionary dead end. But just when it looked like it would barely be a footnote to the European air campaign, a few inventive minds rescued North American's design and gave it a new lease on life. By mid-1943, the Mustang had seen combat as a reconnaissance aircraft, a dive bomber, and a ground attack fighter. As a pure fighter, however, it seemed destined to be a failure. But just as it appeared, the Mustang would be relegated to minor roles in the air war. A few men came up with a brilliant idea that would transform the P-51 into the most effective air superiority fighter history has ever seen. There was a British pilot by the name of Harker who got the idea of taking a Mustang 1 airframe and mating it with a British Merlin engine. And he proposed this to a U.S. Air Force, Army Air Force colonel by the name of Hitchcock, who agreed that this might be a, a worthy thing to do. So they went off and they got approval for this and they took a Merlin engine, put it into a Mustang and discovered that they had a thoroughbred fighter with excellent high altitude capability. The Merlin was being produced in the United States at the time by Packard. And so pretty soon the approval was given to produce the Mustang with the Packard built Merlin engine. And that became the P-51B, the first true strategic fighter of World War II. The uh, British engine that Packard built was extremely reliable. It was a great engine, lots of power and um, altitude performance. It had a two stage, two speed supercharger that let it get to high altitude. So it was a superior performer in every way. With a top speed of almost 450 miles an hour at high altitude, the Merlin-powered Mustang now had the engine needed to carry the fight to the Luftwaffe as an air-to-air -air fighter. British and German fighters generally had an endurance of about 2 to 3 hours, which meant their combat radius was somewhere around 300 miles.
With additional long-range drop tanks, the Mustangs soon proved they could fly for up to eight hours. That meant the P-51 could range over the farthest reaches of Nazi Germany and still return back to their bases. The United States Army Air Force had its strategic fighter, and it appeared on the scene not too soon after. Through the fall of 1943, the heavy bombers of America's 8th Air Force had been taking a beating over Germany. Without escort fighters, the 8th's B-17s and B-24s were being shot to pieces by the Luftwaffe. Their bomber generals had begun screaming for a new fighter that could stay with their groups all the way back to Berlin. It seemed a tall order, but the new P-51B fit the bill perfectly. In the early part uh, of the war, before the Mustangs came in, uh, they couldn't get escort uh, beyond a certain point. The 47s and 38s could only take them part way, and then they had to go back. And uh, when our group came, uh, we could take them clear into target and uh, pick them back up on the other side. So, of course, there were only a handful of us initially, and uh, but we were able to help them a little bit. Later, of course, 51s were all over the place. We used to watch them in prison camp, and uh, when they'd go over and it'd look like each bomber had their own 51 <laughs> escort with them. The P-51s were the workhorses. There were so many more P-51s because their range was farther, and I think their maneuverability was better. They were our little buddies. They didn't have much use for us. <laughs> they, they didn't understand what it was like to drive a truck. <laughs> In December of 1943, the first P-51B group, the 354th, arrived in England. We flew the P-39 up until we got to Europe, uh, up until we left for Europe. We had no idea what we were going to fly when we landed. Uh, we got the cut orders sending Jack Bradley and, and Bob Stevens and myself to an English base to uh, check out a new airplane. When we got back, they were uh, already bringing B-51s in, B model, and uh, so we were off and running in, in B-51. New to combat, the 354th promptly received an education at the hands of the Luftwaffe. We learned that uh, combat is not f really fun sport. On the first mission, uh, was my first mission was about three hours, and uh, the weather was terrible. We were in danger of mid-air collision with each other. Uh, a, uh, I saw no enemy aircraft, but one did come in and shot one plane down. We lost a man, a plane, and a pilot on our very first mission, on the first mission I flew. It was the second mission the group flew. And uh, so I found out that this is serious. Pete Quezada was our commanding general, head of uh, Ninth Fighter Command at that time. Pete came in and talked to us, and I remember him saying, now, you are uh, in a very serious business. Not all of you will live to get home. With their new weapon, however, the Pioneer Mustangs did not take long to score. On December 13, 1943, a pilot from the group's 355th Fighter Squadron shot down an ME-110 over Kiel, Germany. It would be the first of 700 kills, but the price of victory was high. We went overseas with about 75 pilots in the group. Uh, maybe 80 counting pilots in group and so forth. And we lost 220 and 
you got to stop to think that we're the number one scoring group in the war, that we had more victories per loss uh, than any other group, and yet we lose over double our uh, numbers in in the two and a half years we were in combat, two years we were in combat. At first, the Germans were puzzled by the appearance of the Mustang over what had been their own skies. Luftwaffe pilots frequently mistook the 51 for an ME 109 that led to some strange episodes in the air. The Germans didn't know what it was, and uh, in fact, on one early mission, uh, a 109 joined the formation and flew alongside for uh, 10 seconds before he recognized what he had done and peeled off and I uh, <laughs> headed away. I don't remember whether somebody got him or not. Indeed, the P-51 resembled the ME-109 profile so closely that even American aviators were fooled on occasion. Because of the greenhouse canopy, it looked very much like an ME-109. So we had, one of the problems we initially had was uh, getting shot at by our own uh, aircraft. Uh, P-47s primarily uh, never ran into any 38s. Uh, and the 17s and 24s. Despite the recognition problems both sides had with the Merlin engine Mustangs, the new fighter quickly proved it could change the entire nature of the strategic air war over Europe. Well, of course, we could go a lot farther uh, than we could previously. The, I think the operation uh, of the missions remained the same, but the tactics had changed. Initially, Early on with the P-38, we were not allowed to leave the bombers. When the tactics changed that we could go out ahead of the bombers and attack the German uh, fighter force as it was uh, climbing up to do battle against the heavies, that was when the, the uh, shades of war changed because we had a lot better uh, chance to kill the German air force if we could go out and attack them ahead of the bomber force, rather than wait for them to attack the, the bomber force. The 554th Fighter Group and its new Mustangs had changed the nature of the air war, and in doing so had rescued the 8th Air Force faltering strategic bombing campaign. Now it became absolutely essential to get as many P-51s to England as possible. Only then could the Luftwaffe be driven from Europe's skies. In December of 1943, Colonel Don Blakesey paid a visit to the 354th Fighter Group and spent several days teaching the new outfit some of the finer points of air combat tactics used against the Luftwaffe. He led our mission three times, and he obviously liked what he found with the P-51 because he went back and, and uh, pulled strings until the fourth group got him. So uh, he liked it, no question. Blakesley, after flying with the 354th, fell in love with the Mustang. So he went to the CEO of the 8th Fighter Command, General Ike Kepner, and begged Kepner for Mustangs for the 4th Fighter Group. Kepner agreed to let his group convert, provided that they get in the air and fly combat as quickly as possible. And so Blakesley agreed, and he went back to, uh, to the group. He trained the guys very quickly on the P-51, and within just a few days of converting, they were in the skies over Germany. And with their new Mustangs, the 4th Fighter Group went on to become one of the highest-scoring outfits of the war. They finished combat in Europe and didn't fly in the Pacific, so just in Europe, they scored over a thousand air and ground victories. As more P-51Bs arrived in England, the 8th Air Force began to convert its P-47 groups. In January, only about 50 P-51s were combat ready to escort the bombers over Germany. 
By April, however, almost 400 were available, and some of the hottest squadrons in England were now equipped with the revolutionary fighter. As the number of Mustangs in Europe increased, the Luftwaffe's losses skyrocketed. Through the spring of 1944, the German Air Force lost between 10 and 30 percent of its fighter pilots each month. While the Luftwaffe always had planes on hand, by the summer of 1944 it faced a pilot shortage so acute that it proved impossible to solve. Though the Mustang was winning the war in the air, the P-51B model did have a number of bugs that took time to be ironed out. Some of these defects could be disastrous in combat. We had uh, initially a problem with uh, gun feed. You're in a high-speed turn and uh, pull up to so many G's and it would stop your guns from firing. And the wing was so narrow uh, that you couldn't stand the, the uh, machine guns upright in the wing. They had to be uh, over at about a 45 degree angle. And consequently, the, the uh, belt when it came over with the shells, every once in a while as it came over that hump, they'd jam. And uh, so it wasn't at all unusual to uh, fire off a few bursts and have all your guns jam. In fact, a couple of mechanics in our group devised the system which would keep it feeding uh, no matter how many G's you put on. In the early summer of 1944, most of the issues with the P-51B had been solved. The B would remain in service at least until the end of 1944, but long before that, a new version of the Mustang had entered service. Dubbed the P-51D, it would soon earn a reputation as the ultimate Mustang variant. A lot of the 51s had uh, 1,500, 14 and 1,500 horsepower. The Ds, of the ones they used the most, had 16, 15. That was Packard Merlin engines. The visibility is the main thing, because the Ds and Cs had the windshield and all the glass fared right into the back of the aircraft. The D had a big bubble canopy on it, and you had unlimited visibility in that. And that was the biggest uh, advantage, plus the fact that they had uh, more horsepower a little bit. And they had uh, six 50 caliber machine guns on board, three in each plane. And they had different drop bomb shackles and stuff on them. Uh, I shot the six several times just to make sure that we knew what was going to happen because they'd slow you down, oh, 50 miles an hour the minute you start firing. The recoil would slow the airplane right down. And when you had all six of them going, it really looks <laughs> like that. At this time of the war, a lot of our duty was was strafing and dive bombing. And with our new Ds, we went out on a dive bombing mission, and uh, we had, in the three missions we flew that day, I think we had eight planes that peeled the wings off on the dive. And the, the extra gun in each wing had weakened the wings so that uh, right in the middle of your dive, a wing would peel back. Uh, not a terrible place to be. You got a bomb you're writing down, and even if you jump, you're going to be in the middle of the explosion. And they, we got back. They grounded the P-51, and uh, we didn't fly for a couple of days. And then they had modified the wing. We got it back and used it the rest of the war. With the success of the Mustangs in England, fighter units in Italy began converting to the P-51. One of the first outfits to do so was the 332nd Fighter Group, which initially received P-51Bs and Cs, but finished in the war with the D model. Dubbed the Red Tails, the 332nd was the one of the most unique organizations in Army Air Force history. The 332nd was the only all-black fighter group in the United States Air Force. Because of the racial situation in America at that time, 
They were subject to a great deal of abuse and racial prejudice uh, even while they were fighting this war. Uh, but despite those problems that they had with their fellow servicemen, they rose above those issues and they performed admirably, especially in the role of escorts for the heavy bombers in the uh, Italian theater. Commanded by Colonel Benjamin O. Davis Jr., seen here briefing his men, the Red Tails took their new job very seriously. Meticulously prepared and dedicated, the 332nd proved to be the most outstanding escort group of the war. They had an excellent reputation and uh, uh, we were, very all, were always very happy to see them. Uh, they were readily identified with that red tail. And uh, yes, I can, uh, now that I think about it, I can recall at least once when uh, there were fighters approaching us and they took off after them and we went on to the target without uh, a single fighter getting into us. But I'm sure that happened more often than we knew about, too. The 332nd Fighter Group claims one of the most unique distinctions of World War II. Despite all the missions they flew and despite all the opposition they encountered over Germany, especially towards the end of the war, they never lost a bomber that they escorted in any of the groups that they flew with. No other fighter group in World War II can claim that kind of an honor or distinction. While other units scored more of aerial victories, the Red Tails earned the respect and admiration of the 15th Air Force's bomber crews. Where once the Tuskegee Airmen had been spurned and derided, by the end of the war, the bomber groups were requesting them as their escort. We had a good escort. The black guys, uh, they, would, uh, they would fly the 51s and... They'd come up and uh, as we was coming back off our mission and see the one one group would take us into the target and then the other group would uh, escort us home. And uh, so as we was es being escorted home, well, uh, the black guys would get out there and there was one of particular, you know, he, he was a card. He'd get out there and do all kinds of tricks with that plane, you know, it amuses, you know. The Red Tails had become the ultimate little friends, and through their efforts had forged a bond in the air that transcended race and color. Meanwhile, as the groups such as the Pioneer Mustangs and the Red Tails battled the Luftwaffe, the P-51 was poised to bring the war home to another enemy, the Japanese. Soon, the Mustangs would control the skies over Tokyo itself, ensuring Japan's total and irreversible defeat. Early Mustang variants, such as the P-51A and the A-36, had seen action against the Japanese as early as 1943 in the China-Burma-India theater. Those early days of the Mustang operations were unspectacular, but the plane did prove to be faster than anything the Japanese could pit against it. Most frequently, however, the early Mustangs were called upon to deliver ground strikes, strafing targets in Burma and China. Mustang pilots would also go after shipping along the Burma coast, hoping to choke off the supplies to the Imperial Army fighting in the jungle. It was not until the capture of Iwo Jima that the Mustang truly came into its own in the Pacific. We had a whole bunch of uh, Army P-51 Mustangs. That's the reason we took down, spent all that blood, was to provide a staging base for the P-51s to escort the B-29s on their uh, raids against Japan. The 29s were all out of Saipan and Tinian, where we had just come from, 700 miles south, and uh, the uh, 51s would pick them up or meet them as they come over Saipan or over Iwo on the way to Tokyo and escort them to Tokyo and back, which was 1,500 miles up and back to, to Iwo. These fighter escort missions, uh, taking the B-29s to Japan from Iwo Jima, uh, took anywhere from seven to eight hours to complete. And even though the P-51 was an excellent airplane to fly, 
the strain on the legs and lower backs of these pilots for flying for that length of time uh, caused many of them to be cramped up when they returned from these missions to the point where they had to be assisted out of their airplanes by the ground crews. And so to do this day after day over and over again took a great deal of courage and stamina on the parts of these pilots. The first uh, missions uh, we flew were bomber escort. And once we got there and flying up and down the bomber line, we could pick out targets on the ground. We'd go down and uh, nothing definite at first. And later on, we had definite targets like at Sugi Air Base was one of our first targets. And we'd, the B-29s would take us up there specifically to make this run on this air base. They'd wait for us offshore. We'd go in, hit the... Uh, aircraft to defend the installations on these air bases in Japan. B-29s on this type of mission were just escort, escorting us. There are navigational planes, and they'd stay over about 20,000 feet offshore. And we always gave them a high cover, at least four P-51s stay above them, protect them, uh, waiting for us to get off the target and come back. On one occasion, uh, uh, after we'd finished working over this target, we homed in on the B-29, sending us a signal, the lo locator where we could find him. As we approached it, we could see the Japanese starting to make passes on our B-29, which gave us uh, a little bit of worry because he was our ticket back home. And uh, fortunately, the high cover uh, prevented this, and they shot down the attacking Japanese before we got there. By the spring of 1945, Mustangs roamed the length and breadth of the Japanese home islands, protecting the heavy bomber streams while searching for targets of opportunity. Japan's interceptor force was soon driven from the skies. It so happened on this mission uh, over Japan, we were flying in high cover for, for the B-29s, we were up around 25,000 feet, and uh, suddenly I lost power. And uh, the manifold pressure dropped way back, and I, I thought I had serious engine problems. I sweated out for a little while, and I called my wingman, so I'm going to have to go down. And I was just looking for a spot to bail out, because this is the day that they firebombed uh, Tokyo and Yokohama pretty badly. And the <clears throat> fireballs were coming up 5,000 feet high. And... Uh, so I thought I'd get out offshore as far as I could if I had to jump out. As I was descending, uh, trying to get my engine running again, uh, we noticed uh, several Tojos below us and climbing towards the B-29. And uh, I was directly behind one Tojo, and so I just closed in as fast as I could and opened fire. And the debris started flying off, and uh, my wingman shot one on, on the left side there. So, I still was concerned about my engine, but I forgot it during the, the combat. And uh, I didn't realize until I got well, well off the target, the engine was running pretty well again. With little fuel available and even fewer experienced pilots, Japan's air defenses collapsed. Yes, there was quite a difference in the, the Japanese pilots near the end of the war. In fact, uh, I think the group we ran into, the Tojos, I think it was just a big training group because they were just flying as no invasive attempt or anything on their part. And we just closed in on them and just like shooting ducks. If I had had a better engine, I probably would have stayed longer in that group. But uh, and there's, several of them were shot down by the other P-51 pilots. By the summer of 1945, the Iwo-based Mustangs had gained total control of the skies over Japan. Without fear of interception, the P-51s went down the deck and searched for targets of opportunity. Nothing was safe from their murderous 50 cals.
When Japan finally surrendered in August of 1945, there were hundreds of P-51s based on Iwo Jima ready to support the planned invasion of Kyushu. Fortunately, the surrender made that operation unnecessary. In the final months of the war in Europe, almost 2,000 Mustangs protected the American heavy bombers. Such protective shield proved almost impossible for the Luftwaffe to penetrate. Bomber losses plummeted and Germany's cities and industries were systematically devastated by the American strategic bombing campaign. With the fighters knocking down every German plane they saw in the sky and the bombers pulverizing Germany's war industry on the ground, the Allied forces were virtually unopposed in the air. Flak and small arms fire, however, still posed a great threat, especially to the liquid-cooled engine of the Mustang. We were uh, out on a search and destroy mission, and I found six German trucks on the road, went in strafing and set four of them on fire on the first pass and pulled up. I had not seen any return fire, so I went back to get the other two. And when I went back the second time, I find myself going across a open field with a hundred German soldiers on their knees with rifles uh, firing at us. And probably they came from the trucks we'd burned. And a P-51 will not take a lot of punishment if you lose your coolant, you're done. So. And I lost my coolant. I got up to 8,000 feet, and uh, the uh, coolant hit temperature, hit the red peg, and there was no way I began to lose power. Uh, started uh, calling for May Day for a fix. So I pulled the red handle, and the canopy flew off, just like they told me it would. I started to jump and I had my shoulder straps laying on my shoulder, pulled me back. I picked up the microphone, said goodbye, undid the shoulder straps, made another jump. I hit the end of the radio cord, couldn't uh, get back, drop back in. As long as I was back, I said goodbye, unplugged the radio, made a third attempt and uh, got my head out. I'm going 100 miles an hour, uh, 105 maybe, and the wind caught my goggles and pulled them out about a foot from my head. I pulled my head back and they snapped back and I dropped back down in the seat. So I plugged the radio in and said goodbye, took the helmet off and fourth try I got out. Found myself hanging very quietly over a tank battle uh, down below me. Quiet up in the air, no sound in the air, but a lot of sound, gunfire. Both heavy and light gunfire down below. I was east of Metz, and the Germans still held Metz. I get on the ground, I hid under a bush. A German half-track pulled into the field, and uh, two soldiers with rifles uh, were looking for me. I uh, thought, well... They know I'm here, so I stood up and put my hand up. Got halfway there, and uh, and I noticed that over the German Iron Cross was a crudely painted white star, and there were a captured vehicle, and they were part of Army, Patton's Third Army, and they were uh, 40 miles ahead of where they thought people thought they were, and so I got a ride with them. And uh, the next day, they flew me back by a, a Cub observation plane to my base. Even though the liquid-cooled engine was a drawback when the 51s were used to hit ground targets, the Mustang was still considered to be the best mass-produced fighter of the war, and some would argue of all time. Near the end of World War II, the Mustang's apex of success had been reached. But even at this pinnacle, the shadow of its own downfall could be seen on the horizon. 
With the advent of the Messerschmitt 262, the first operational jet fighter, the Germans had really dealt the death blow to the piston engine fighter design. And while the Messerschmitt 262 really represented the future, the pilots flying the older designs, the Mustangs, really figured out in the final days of the war, how best to fight their aircraft against this new technological marvel. And so on many occasions, the Mustang pilots actually came out on top, despite the Messerschmitt 262's amazing speed. On this particular day, uh, in April 45, I was on a search and destroy mission. I was at 12,000 feet with four planes. Uh, I spotted movement down below me, and I recognized the silhouette of a Messerschmitt 262 jet, and I had uh, 10,000 feet altitude. He was at two. So I rolled over. I was determined he wasn't going to get away from me, so I, uh, I, I beat Chuck Yeager through the sound barrier. I, I th thought the airplane was coming apart. I went into what's called compressibility, lost complete control of the aircraft. It felt like the control stick had become unhooked. Uh, it was all over the cockpit and nothing happened. And, uh, as I'm going down to lower altitude, the thicker the air got, the more I began to feel something on the stick. I prayed for uh, it to be there and I began to ease out and I came out and would you believe the 262 was right square in front of me. I didn't, I don't think I moved uh, uh, two degrees before I started shooting. And I shot a piece of one wing off and shot the left jet on, set the left jet on fire. And I was overrunning him, so I pulled off and was going to come back. But by the time I pulled off, he was going straight up. P-51s won't go straight up very long. I tried to go after him, but he was going straight up, and I uh, thought I'd lost him. Uh, one jet was burning, and all of a sudden he stopped and started sliding back down, tail first, and he ejected and uh, hung in his parachute. And I felt like uh, the champion of the world. I just I was ecstatic. In 1996, I think it was, I went to the German fighter pilots meeting and met the pilot I shot down. He and his wife both gave me a big hug. He says, you saved my life. He says, I had 25 pilots in my unit when you shot me down. And he said he had a bullet wound in his left side, so he never had to fly again. And uh, because of that, he said, uh, Two weeks, two, three weeks later, there were only four of my unit alive, and he said, so you saved my life. I said, no problem, buddy, any time. When the war ended, the new jet fighters like the P-80 and F-86 soon eclipsed the Mustang as America's premier air superiority fighter. But for a fleeting moment, the P-51 had become a king of the skies. But all too soon, the march of technology had bumped it from its throne. Within just a few years of the war's end, the Mustang had been relegated to second-line steps. Altogether, about 15,000 P-51s have been built, but thousands were scrapped wholesale in the months following the end of the war. Others, a precious few, were sold off to racing pilots and enthusiasts. During the first year of the Korean War, the Mustang reclaimed a bit of its lost glory, as it was pressed back into service as a ground attack aircraft. But with its vulnerable liquid-cooled engine, the P-51 was replaced as quickly as possible with a more modern jet aircraft. Today, the once mighty horde of the Mustang that conquered the skies of Europe has been reduced to less than 100 flying examples. Every year at air shows throughout the United States, these precious relics take to the air before crowds of thousands. 
reminding Americans of our proud aviation heritage and those grueling days when the Mustangs filled the skies in a desperate fight for freedom. Never had anybody say they didn't want to fly. In fact, it was just the other way around. People hanging on my back saying, come on, he flew yesterday. I want to put me on the day. Does that mean it was fun? No, uh, it's dead serious. We did every job we were given the entire war and, uh, and did them well. It cost us a lot of people. It was another way you proved that what Sherman said was right, that war is hell, and it is. If you enjoyed this video, please remember to like and subscribe. And as always, thank you for watching. Aviation, the art of aeronautics, began with the dreamers, inventors, and daredevils who dared to defy gravity. The journey of aviation was nurtured by pioneers like the Wright brothers, whose first flight marked a historic milestone. The role of aircrafts in world wars was groundbreaking, dramatically changing warfare strategies. This initiated a technological evolution in aviation, transforming the simplistic wings of a biplane into the thunderous roar of jet engines. Let's journey through the ages of aviation. Behind every great aircraft, there were great minds. These visionaries, like Sir Frank Whittle, the innovator of the turbojet engine, redefined air travel. Then there's Skunk Works Kelly Johnson, the genius behind the SR-71 Blackbird. His designs combined speed, stealth and power, crafting machines that dominated the heavens. The contributions of these pioneers have left an indelible mark on the canvas of aviation, shaping the course of history and inspiring generations of engineers and aviators. Each epoch in aviation history gave birth to extraordinary aircrafts, each with their own unique features and roles. The Lockheed SR-71 Blackbird was a marvel of speed and stealth. The F-105 Thunderchief, a supersonic fighter bomber, was vital in the Vietnam War. The P-51 Mustang, a long-range fighter, was critical in World War II. The P-47 Thunderbolt, a heavyweight fighter, was used extensively in the same war. The A-10 Thunderbolt II, the Warthog, is a close air support icon. The Messerschmitt ME262 marked a leap forward in aviation technology. Each of these game changers were instrumental in their eras, and their legacies still resonate today. Beyond the game changers, there are those that have transcended their practical roles to become icons. The Concorde was not just an aircraft, it was a supersonic symbol of luxury and speed. The B-52 Stratofortress, a strategic bomber, is an icon of power and resilience. These magnificent machines and others like them have become much more than just aircrafts. They are enduring icons that encapsulate the audacious spirit, the relentless innovation, and the boundless ambition that define the world of aviation. For more amazing aerial footage, and to join us in this incredible journey, check out the Dronescape's YouTube channel. If you enjoyed this video, please remember to like and subscribe. And as always, thank you for watching.